Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to speak to you on um, a couple of different things today, but um, as you're joining, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, where you're joining from, um, what organization you work for, what your role is, and why you're here today. I see more people are joining, that's great. We're happy to have you all here today, fantastic. Go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to hear from where you're, where you're coming from, what you do there, and why you're here. I know it's two o'clock on the dot Eastern time. We'll give it, a, I think a minute or so for other folks to join, share in the chat. While we're waiting, I can introduce myself. Uh, make sure you're muted, of course, um, and you can ask questions in the chat as we go along. This meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded later, and so you, you can share with others or you can go back and view it later. Um, we also have a uh, transcript enabled, so you have to turn that on yourself. If you look at the bottom of your screen, I believe, you should be able to turn that on. Um, so you can follow along that way as well. All right, I think we have quite a few folks. We can, I think, go ahead and get started. Jessica, you want to get started? Yeah, great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Hay. I use she, her pronouns, and I uh, work with National Girls Collaborative Project, and I'm so happy that you all joined us today. We're really excited about the content of this webinar and being able to share what's been happening um, across the country with these if then um, collection grants. So uh, I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of overview of the National Girls Collaborative Project and what we do. So the and, and then after that, we'll do the showcase. <laughs> and um, and then you're going to actually hear from folks implementing these grants. That's the exciting part, um, is getting to hear what's happening all over the country. So the vision of the National Girls Collaborative Project is to support and create science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, so STEM, um, experiences that are as diverse as the world we live in. To do this, NGCP connects, creates, and collaborates with a network of advocates to promote equity and transform STEM for all girls and all youth. NGCP exists because today's STEM experiences continue to lack diversity. Many young people do not identify with this field. And so to create change, our work empowers providers, educators, leaders, and youth themselves. So NGCP believes STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. So our initiatives build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. We share resources and solutions with a coalition of leaders and via our website, newsletters, online databases, social media and webinars like this one. And GCP also strengthens the capacity of programs by producing and sharing exemplary practices, research and program models. So when programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. We distribute these resources in really accessible formats such as train the trainer programs and partnerships and online platforms. And finally, we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, advocates and youth, so that together we can create that tipping point for gender equity in STEM. So the National Girls Collaborative Project engages in many activities virtually and nationally, as well as through our local collaboratives who you get to hear from today. NGCP partners with organizations to scale and deliver content such as the Leap into Science National Network in partnership with the Franklin Institute and the Million Girls Moonshot partner in partnership and the Million Girls Moonshot in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School Statewide Networks. Partnerships like these serve hundreds of educators via local networks. And GCP is working with Lida Hill Philanthropies and has launched the If Then Collection which is a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. These media are available at no cost, and you'll learn more about the collection today. 
NGCP also hosts the Youth Advisory Board. And so the board helps to review and provide feedback on current National Girls Collaborative Project initiatives and assists in informing the future direction of NGCP. NGCP also manages the Connectory, which is the largest national database of STEM opportunities. The Connectory also provides a way for program providers to connect and collaborate with each other. And then there's also Fab Femmes, which is an international database of female role models from many STEM fields. They are passionate about the work that they do and are ready to connect with programs to really spark girls' interests. We offer regular webinars such as this one, um, focused on research, exemplary practices, high quality resources to really help our network grow and thrive. Locally state collaborative leadership teams offer convenings providing uh, professional development, mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available. And they also distribute their own regular newsletters spotlighting local resources. The National Girls Collaborative Project has been partially funded by the National Science Foundation since 2002. Uh, we actually began as the Northwest Girls Collaborative Project fo focused on Washington and Oregon. Um, and then as we presented our collaboration model to others, we were invited to expand across the US. While NGCP programs and partners are located in every state, we have 33 collaboratives serving 41 states facilitating collaboration between 42,500 organizations who serve 20.2 million girls and 10 million boys. Pretty amazing work happening all over the country. Um, one of the uh, projects that I mentioned was the If Then Collection. And so I'm gonna give a little bit more info on If Then before we hear about what's happening locally. So the If Then Initiative is a national effort that's sponsored by Lida Hill Philanthropies to really inspire girls to pursue STEM careers while creating a culture shift in how the world perceives women in STEM. If then seeks to further advance women in STEM by empowering current innovators and inspiring the next generation of pioneers. The If Then Collection is the largest free resource of its kind dedicated to increasing access to authentic, relatable images of real women in STEM. In this digital library, you'll find thousands of photos, videos, and other assets um, that feature, uh, that authentically represent women in STEM. The content features uh, careers such as shark tagging, which every time I say that, it just makes me smile because I think it's such a unique career featured in there. Um, fashion design, training Olympic athletes, uh, coders for YouTube, and so much more. And it really nudges the public perceptions in a more realistic direction that illuminates the importance of STEM everywhere. If then is really proud to recognize 125 talented women STEM professionals across a variety of industries as triple AS if then ambassadors who serve as high profile role models um, for folks across the country. And that is kind of our, our very quick background into if then, um, and I'm gonna pass it back to uh, my colleague Lahari to get us going on our local work that's happening. All right, hello, so sorry. Between sharing screen and looking at the chat, I could not find the unmute button. You think after a year doing virtual work, we know how to do this by now. All right, yes, I, my name is Lahiri Chelasani. I am a senior manager of programs here at the National, Girl, uh, National Girls Collaborative Project. And I'm excited to introduce some of our speakers here today. And these folks um, were recipients of the NGCP Collaborative If Then Collection Grants. So there was a total of five grantees and the states are California, Louisiana, Montana, New York, and Tennessee. And these partners, um, these collaborative partners, what they did was they created a mini grant application process, which they then um, reached out to their individual communities in their states to um, implement this if then collection um, into their programming. And so this programming um, is taking place between September and January. And we're really excited to see some of the results from, from this uh, grant cycle. 
And so first up, we have Dale McCready, she, um, PhD. Um, she is a vice president of audience and community engagement. Dr. McCready joined the Discovery Center at Murphy Spring in Murfreesboro, Tennessee in 2016. Her position builds on three decades in the science museum world, leading program development, community engagement, and professional learning. Her research background focuses on family engagement and girls and women in STEM. She serves as the lead for the Tennessee Girls Collaborative, profiting from years in Pennsylvania's collaborative where she was also involved. She has the unique position of holding a position jointly funded by Discovery Center and Middle Tennessee State University. Um, and so Dale, let me know whenever you want me to um, advance the slides. Will do, thanks for here. Um, hi everyone, uh, great to sort of see you. Um, I am coming to you from Tennessee where we um, just completed our Tennessee STEAM Festival. Uh, not a new thing for many of you, but for us, it was just our fifth year. And we here at Discovery Center spearheaded that festival. And this was of course our fifth year, but our, uh, well, three years pre-COVID, then last year was almost all virtual or outside. And this year was sort of a mixture of all of that. Um, and plus we uh, expanded to include um, what some of you might have called a carnival or a special day where there were activities um, around uh, STEM. Um, we called it our STEMA Palooza. So um, in any case, we're, a, we're a, really a medium-sized children's museum and the opportunity to, to provide seed grants uh, and the reason why I have the STEAM Festival little logo there um, on my screen is because the, they, the two came together at just the right time. You know, we're trying to reach across what's a very big state, um, you know, eight hours at least from, from um, east to west, and trying to really think about how we can embed STEAM across all, country, all counties, many of which are very, very rural. Um, so that was kind of our charge. So, so leveraging, it was all about leveraging, right? So um, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, so for us, we said, okay, what, what do we want to achieve through these seed grants? And so we really, um, and perhaps very complex, but we wanted to really promote three different things, right? We wanted to increase the use and awareness of the If Then collection, which really reflected our institutional, as well as, as the lead for the Tennessee Girls Collaborative, you know, our commitment to women in STEM. We wanted to grow awareness of our collaborative. Uh, we wanted to promote the Tennessee STEAM Festival so that we could really begin and continue to grow that. Um, we wanted to cultivate some really diverse um, thinking by institutions and organizations about ways they could, could um, promote and use these resources. And then we also wanted to, to build a real critical awareness of the many ways that one can engage in STEM careers and the diversity of who, who um, does it. So uh, next slide, please. So this is our flyer about the steam of Palooza. Um, I just wanted to call out, there were really, um, these are examples of the, the, the relationships that popped out of all of these seed grants and the festival and the collaborative. Um, top right is Lipscomb University. They um, asked for seed uh, money to um, do some teacher PD and, and also build a focus on engineering. Uh, and then they attended our Steam Palooza with activities that also promoted that. And although you can't see up close in the bottom right hand corner, uh, they actually developed some wonderful postcards that talked about the Palooza, uh, uh, sorry, talked about the event collection, um, and then on the back um, actually promoted both the STEAM Festival and their own work at Lipscomb. So really, we're, we've encouraged also all of our C grantees to leverage as much as possible. It makes a lot of sense, right? Um, at the bottom right is the Tennessee Engagement Center, which is a, a, one of the sites of the Rutherford County uh, where, Murfrees, where Murfreesboro is located, the Rutherford County Library. Uh, system. And so they did a big event focused on astronomy at their institution with a special event and then also um, presented here in our Palooza. And then on the on the left side um, is is the booth that we had for our collaboration. And we actually embedded an activity that we had used that focused on uh, one of the ambassadors that was Hispanic for our Hispanic um, heritage celebration, and then also in, uh, handed out paper versions of a bingo game that focused on the hobbies and the interests of ambassadors 
um, that we had developed as part of an exhibit inside with some Aztec funding for If Then. So we really wanted to try to leverage this idea of the ambassadors as really fun, exciting people. They had hobbies, they have hobbies, they have lives. Some of the hobbies in, involve their careers, but many don't. Um, and so really, how can we highlight um, those, those sorts of special um, opportunities? And so that's, that was our bingo game and we handed that out as well. Um, last, next slide, please. And so this is just a snapshot and I'm not gonna focus on most of this except for some of the strategies, which were a little unique. Um, we did leverage these, um, you know, ask folks to leverage the seed money to um, achieve their goals as well as ours. And we had tiered funding that um, the highest funding was $1,000. And that was um, evidence of really trying to expand and disseminate resources in, in the biggest of ways of all the funding streams. So you can see we have universities, we have um, early childhood centers, we have the libraries, we have Turn of Green, which is a um, nonprofit for sustainability through reuse, really diverse partnerships and organizations. And, and I have to say, um, having these resources, uh, even when I'm on Zooms with some of these partners, I don't always have an excuse to talk to everyone. I mean, we all are pretty good at trying to make excuses, right? To build our network and to talk, but how wonderful is it when we can actually say we have posters or we have resources or we want to partner with you. And so um, we actually uh, were able to um, give out 115 poster sets. Many of them um, were went to some schools and some organizations attached to schools while working with uh, informal organizations uh, through through C grant for projects and that kind of thing. As you can see, our audience went from pre-K because ETSU uh, went to an early childhood conference and they started to talk about ways you could use these resources for children, which is something we as a children's museum have thought about as well. Um, and so we did pre-K through college, families in school and out, girls and educators. Um, and I think that the, and it's still growing, right? We don't even really know our impact. We know a couple of these events reached, you know, 340 teachers, the, the posters themselves, um, probably reached, you know, another 115 teachers. And if you multiply by kids who get to see this, it, it, the number grows very quickly. Um, but there was everything from themed awareness, you know, uh, Lipsum did, did the engineering program, um, to developing activity kits that could be given out, uh, to sharing, um, um, you know, information specific to any kind of workshops for whatever audience. Promotions, promotion through postcards. And then there's also been this wonderful, wonderful virtual um, promotion through um, websites and um, you know, newsletters and all that kind of thing. So it's been really a wonderful way, both for us as a fairly small museum to get the word out about us, to build interest and enthusiasm about the Tennessee um, Girls Collaborative. And then for that sh short period of time to really sort of leverage the festival happening, which was happening statewide as well. So that's, I'll stop there and happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. I really liked your point about, um, you know, we always try to just keep growing networks and maintain relationships by reaching out to one another. But I liked how you said, but now I have something to give them in on top of being able to talk to them. So I liked, I liked that um, point there. All right, so now we're gonna hear from um, two folks from Montana. So we have Susie Taylor and Sierra. Um, Susie Taylor is the co-leader of the uh, Montana, STEM, Montana Girl STEM Collaborative and director of uh, the Science and Math Resource Center in the Department of Education at Montana State University. She has a long history of leading outreach programs for MSU, including leading Montana NSF EPSCORE's Track One projects and partnering with faculties faculty on programs funded by NASA, USDA, the Department of Energy, and other agencies to create outreach projects that support the citizens of Montana. Susie has a special interest in reaching youth in Montana's smallest and most rural communities. And some of her favorite projects have included working with 40 Montana classrooms as they virtually followed an MSU geology expedition, expedition to Mount Everest, helping to launch science action clubs all over Montana and leading a statewide geo coaching project tied to the Montana Climate Assessment. We also have Sierra Fisher Dykeman here, and she is the intern for the Montana uh, Girl STEM Collaborative. She is currently student teaching to complete her degrees in elementary education, special education, and Spanish at Montana State University. 
Over the past two years, Sierra has gotten involved in STEM by considering ways to make projects and materials available for underrepresented youth. Her work on a recent NASA collaboration allowed her to make NASA equipment accessible for students with disabilities. After she graduates, she hopes to continue to make STEM resources access available for all. So Susie and Sierra, thank you for being here. And uh, let me know when you want me to advance slides. Sounds good. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Susie. Um, I'm with you just for a few seconds here, because really, it's my honor to present Sierra. Um, she's been a fantastic intern with us and um, really has been involved in this program since writing the proposal to do in publicity to gathering um, a review team from our advisory board and then working with our grantees. So I'm going to turn it over to Sierra and she will tell you about our mini grant program in Montana. Um, thanks, Susie, for the introduction. Um, and thanks to the National Girls STEM Collaborative and Light Hill Philanthropies for making this all possible. Um, like Susie said, my name is Sierra fisher Um I'm the intern for the Montana Girls STEM Collaborative. Um, I've been working really closely with this grant and I'm so excited to see it just taking off. Um, so when considering kind of a project to impact the highest number of students in Montana, we decided that awarding mini grants were conclusively kind of the best opportunity to serve Montana students. Um, for a little bit of perspective, I know Montana's, you know, we're kind of off to the side here. Um, Montana is the fourth largest state in the country by area, um, but we're 45th in population. So we have just over 1 million people in the entire state, um, but we have a lot of ground to cover to provide access to STEM materials for all of our students. Something to think about is that 75% of Montana schools are considered rural, with 95% of school districts considered rural. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover for STEM materials. Um, additionally, we have seven Native American reservations across the state, which just adds to our consideration of reaching the most students possible, considering circumstances like distance, availability, resources, um, things like that. So we were really pleasantly surprised with the diversity of our applications, both in physical location and in type of project. Um, do you mind advancing the slide, please? So this map that you will see coming up, um, all of the stars are towns and locations that the recipients' projects will access through their outreach efforts. Um, so as you can see, most of the most parts of the state here are being served through these various projects, which is pretty impressive. Um, though we only had eight um, grant awardees for this that we chose, a lot of them are serving a lot of different places. So that's why you'll see different stars across the state. Um, so. I think that the power and the outreach of these grants kind of speak for themselves. So today I'm just going to do a brief overview of all of our amazing projects that we selected to receive mini grants. And then I'm going to dive deeper just a little bit into two of our projects and kind of their specific use within the event collection. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so Ingenium is stationed in Great Falls. Their project is helping underrepresented youth access video game design and computer science. So they are uh, a nonprofit. Um, certified PlayStation game development studio. So they're giving kids the opportunity to try out video games and you know, be able to be a part of that STEM community. Um, in the event collection, Heather Chandler is the former Fortnite producer. So they're going to be using her materials to kind of um, inspire girls in STEM that they can also go into a pretty male dominated force. Um, so that's ingenium. Just below that, Code Girls United is based in Kalispell mostly, but they actually serve 14 project locations across Montana. So that's definitely one of our biggest outreach um, supporters. Their project is um, creating a coding summer camp for girls. So obviously this hasn't happened yet. It'll be a little past our deadline, but it's in the works. Um, so they're working on adding the If Then collection into their programming year round, um, which is awesome. So they are just going to use it, be using a lot of different parts of the if, if then collection um, to help girls to see that they can be a part of coding as well. Uh, the George McCone Memorial Library is in Circle, Montana. That's one of our smallest towns um, that we chose. So we were pretty excited to have them. Um, what they're working on is building a library makerspace. So what that means for them is it's going to be putting these collections up um, around their makerspace. They're using some of the funding to buy STEM material. And they will also be hosting classes for local Girl Scout troops to be able to utilize these STEM materials um, within the library. So they're going to be using this then collection to share these materials throughout the library and with all of their groups that are coming in. Um, the next one is Wise Wonders Children's Museum, which is in Billings, Montana. Billings is one of our bigger cities in Montana. Um, so their project is creating a billboard in a high traffic area. And I just got an update actually that this billboard um, will be seen by 150,000 people each week which is great. And they had a funding match 
um, from one of their other donors, they're actually able to double the time that this billboard will be up, which is pretty exciting. Um, so 150,000 people per week, which is an amazing outreach. So they'll be using the collection on the billboard to help inspire young girls to pursue STEM careers and also to provide information on how to access materials at their museum. So they're kind of dueling here, um, but this is getting out to everyone, which I love how big their outreach is. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so University of Montana Department of Teaching and Learning is uh, at one of our two universities, large universities in Montana in Missoula. Um, their project is to choreograph and perform a dance with robots in a mini STEM camp. Um, again, super, you know, thinking out of the box, like one of our, our comments here. I'll be talking a little bit more about this one. So I don't want to go too into depth, but their if then collection integration is featuring Goldie Blocks' Fast Forward Girls video um, with Nicole Leno, who works alongside um, Katie Kwan, I believe is how I pronounce her name. Um, she's a professional dancer, dancer and mechanical engineer. So I'll talk a little bit more about that one. So I'm gonna leave that there, but more is coming. Um, Upward Bound in Missoula, their project is creating an, an astronomy event for students. Um, so they are sharing women astronomists in the collection and then related um, careers from the collection as well. I will also be going into more about that one. So I'm gonna leave that there for just a second. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Richmond County is in Sydney, Montana. Um, they are going to be using their funding kind of on the other side of that to do STEM presentations for students and training professional development for teachers. So through the if then collection with them, girls will be able to learn what careers are available to them in STEM fields. Um, so just kind of using that broader collection to help let girls know what's available. Um, and finally, SAE International um, is an international company, but they have a um, base in Montana. So they are actually working on highlighting their own STEM role model in addition to, to highlighting the if then collection. So we just got an update from them that they um, feature the if then collection in a STEM comic book that they put out, which is super exciting because there's a lot of outreach happening there. Um, so I wanna go specifically into that Upward Bound project, which is on that bottom left there. So their astronomy event is reaching students in Missoula and Browning. Um, so this event is designed to share the night sky with students through multiple platforms. So um, they're featuring the FN collection kind of as a precursor to their camps, allowing students from the very start to envision themselves as scientists. Um, specifically, they'll be sharing a few of the women involved in astrology through the FN collection, Kelly Corrick and Dr. Erica Hamden. Sorry, Dr. Kelly Corrick and Dr. Erica Hamden are a few examples. Um, so I know they have some others as well. So students will get to attend Gems of the Night Sky in the University of Montana's Planetarium. So that's highlighting stars that are visible in the Montana skies. And then after that, they, they get to use upward bound telescopes to explore the stars in Montana and apply what they've learned from that planetarium show into the, the night sky in Montana. Um, so after that, Native scholars will also be sharing star stories. Um, so that's a great Indian education for all connection there, um, utilizing some of our great resources in Montana. Um, and then all of Upward Bound students are low income and or first generation students in Missoula and on the Black Heat Reservation in Browning, Montana. 62% um, of the students there are Native American and 65% are female. So that's highlighting just two really typically underrepresented groups in STEM and really targeting them in some really meaningful activities. Um, so we're pretty excited to see how that one turns out. Um, the other one I'd like to talk about just a little bit more is that Coding Through Dance Camp, which is also in Missoula. Um, so I talked about who would be featuring, and it's just using the if then collection to help spark interest in both choreography and figuring out how to connect dance to robotic engineering, which are seemingly two very different things. Um, but their integration, students are learning to code a sequence of moves and perform dance by using abstract notation to represent movement, direction, and speed. So they'll be using the Ozbot robot. Those are coded basically just using a simple sequence of primary colors drawn on paper. So a change in colors, um, change the robot speed, direction, makes it turn, change color, et cetera. So students will be using those robots to choreograph a dance, and then we'll also be dancing along with the robots. So nothing I ever thought would come together, but I'm also really excited to see how that, how that dance turns out. Um, so all of our grantees are doing already tremendous work utilizing the SN collection and finding ways to not only make STEM accessible to a high population of girls, but also those typically underrepresented in, in STEM. Um, so we are so excited to, you know, keep watching these projects develop and grow 
and also help our Montana students to have just some great access to really authentic STEM materials. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. I really like that note about um, the billboard because you know we have a lot of folks that come to museums, come to our physical spaces for STEM. And yeah, it's really easy to put up these posters, but really putting it in a place that you wouldn't expect and maybe it sparks something that for someone that if they've never been to a museum before or things like that, you're really making those connections. And I also really like the out-of-box thinking along with the, the programming itself, right? Like you said, the, the dancing um, with coding um, because future problems require multiple mindsets or multiple in, like interdisciplinary um, uh, views on that. So I love, I love how your programs are doing that. Thank you for sharing. And then our last speaker today is from New York. Um, Sarah Kobilka is the owner and principal consultant for Renaissance Women Consulting, LLC. Sarah's passion about education, communication, outreach, networking, and DEIAA issues. She has spent decades specializing in science communication in TV, radio, education, and the nonprofit realm, and utilizing her training as a scientist, journalist, and educator to bridge gaps between the scientific community and those who consider themselves to be outside of it. Sarah is involved nationally in diversity in STEM and STEM engagement initiatives that seek to inspire interest and excitement for STEM broadly. She's on the leadership team for the New York STEAM Girls Collaborative, and Sarah enjoys a Renaissance woman lifestyle filled with unusual adventures and intriguing people. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me know when you want me to advance. Excellent. Thank you so much for this opportunity um, to share. Uh, I am actually one of the newest members of the New York STEM, uh, STEAM Girls Collaborative uh, leadership team. And so uh, it's really exciting to see what's happening here. I was previously involved in Arizona with Michelle Higgins and uh, Sci Girls Trainer as well. It's how I first got involved with National Girls Collaborative Project. So I'm going to be talking on the next slide about a few of the things that the uh, New York Collaborative did for this project. And I want to um, let you know that so our lead agency is the New York State Network for Youth Success. And that lead agency put in the request for the funding and really took the lead in writing it. So I myself wasn't involved in writing it, but when um, the proposal for the funding from NGCP, but I think one successful thing that they did, and I, I believe it looks like uh, Montana also took advantage of, is getting funding for people to spearhead the project who have the time and capacity to do it. Because we have a phenomenal leadership team of amazing people who have a lot on their their plates. And at that point in time, I happened to have a little bit less going on and had the capacity to take on a little bit more. And they were able to provide some funding to me so that I could lead this effort. So I think that's one thing that we always want to think about is that, yes, this is great, but unless you can tie it in like Dale did directly to the work that her museum is doing, it can sometimes kind of get pushed off to the side. Uh, the goal of the uh, um, that Nice Nice wanted to do was to leverage existing networks. So Nice Nice is connected to a number of different things here in New York. New York has a STEM ecosystems effort. There are STEM hubs across the state and there are 15 regional after school networks. And that same idea of leveraging that Dale talked about they have a desire to build closer relationships, in particular with the STEM ecosystems and the STEM hubs. So being able to go into the situation and say, hey, we want to be your friend and we want to share something with you. That idea was definitely uh, built upon. And then, of course, the regional after school networks are already um, very well connected with Nice Nice. One of my first questions when I was asked to take a take a part in this project is, well, do we really actually know what the needs are of these after school providers in terms of what the resources are that are going to be coming from the then collection? And so I worked with Timothy Fowler from Nice Nice to put together a survey I'm going to be discussing. And then also there is a proposal much like uh, the other two organizations to, to spread the love. Uh, let's take this money and rather than keeping it for our collaborative, let's spread it out to the people in our state who we know are doing really good work. So we're um, giving 500, three $500 awards. So on the next slide, I'm gonna talk first a little bit about that survey that I created. And there are four different questions on the survey. I wanted it to be super short and sweet, um, but to gather some really interesting information. And uh, caveat, 
only 10 people have filled it out. So there is no statistical significance necessarily to what I'm sharing, but I did see some patterns emerging. So when we're talking about the free resources they'd be most likely to use, number one thing is activities and do-it-yourself experiments focused on the work of the STEM ambassador, as well as virtual visits from the ambassador. And when I first read that, that was a little bit of a, a question mark for me because I at first I was like oh well you know we really push the if then collection as being a wonderful collection of pictures and videos but it's not the pictures and videos that were necessarily the initial message that I got about the if then collection that the people in the after school world were looking for now I think once they get going with the activities and the experiments and the ambassador they're going to want to have those visuals to go along with it but in their minds the thing that's most important to them are those activities and the virtual visits the other things that you see in um, black are had at least seven people interested in them uh, work books exploring careers and activities about gender equity were the next most popular and then the short video was the um followed that so this is the first question about like what what would you actually use from the if then collection the second question on the next slide that we looked at was looking at what would drive them to pick a particular STEM ambassador to highlight in their programming. And by far, every single person who answered the survey said that they wanted somebody working in a field that they were learning about. So they're not necessarily looking, I, what I take away from this is that they're not necessarily looking to find somebody just to highlight, hey, this is a woman in STEM. They really want that relevant side of things. They really want to tie it to the activities, the theme, whatever it is that they're already thinking about. And then second most popular is overcame adversity. And that is definitely going to uh, tie into what I'm going to talk about in the next question. I was a little bit surprised to see that somebody being from New York, which, you know, it doesn't matter all that much. And I had actually taken the time to make a cheat sheet and you can do the search and filter by state, for example, to see who are the people who are close to us. That didn't matter as much the people we were surveying, um, but the overcoming adversity is very important. So on the next slide, you're going to see the third question that was asked, and it's really trying to get at what are um, people who are working in the after school world contending with right now? Because we're coming off a pandemic, we're dealing with people having gone through some really horrific times. We're all trauma, uh, having <laughs> trauma, basically. So if you can advance to the next slide, the question is really what is the most important thing for what they're focusing on in their programs this year. And while that hands on learning is still right up there, that social emotional learning side of things, the overcoming trauma that is extremely important. So great, we can do a hands on and say I know how to do engineering, but that backstory that those and that are that is being told and I think the backstory um, you can get the part of the backstory one by watching the videos of those stem um, AAAS stem ambassadors, but you also get that backstory from some of the activities um, that have been designed, especially for that after school setting uh, to think about trauma and emotional learning and that sort of thing. So really, it is that hands on learning and then that social emotional and trauma. Uh, that is front of mind um, because they know that they're dealing with kids who have been through a lot in this last year and a half and they want to support them. And then the final question was, well, how do I let them know about this stuff? Like, what is their preferred method for actually learning about that collection? And number one, email. That's what they wanted to get. And in fact, that's how we let people know about our award, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, but they just want to get that email. So tapping into the listservs of those different organizations that we were talking about, the STEM hubs, the after school networks, that's a huge way to get that information out. But the number two thing was step by step videos that are five minutes or less. And I'm going to you're going to get to hear a little bit more about that idea. Um, when I am done speaking. So the last uh, two slides I'm going to show you, I'll just very briefly talk about the awards that we're giving out. Three awards to all girl, um, to all girls serving out of school programs in New York. 
made a super simple application. The link has already been shown thrown in the chat and maybe we'll throw it in again. Um, I just made a copy of the survey so that everyone can look at it. We made it really broad as to what they could actually spend the money on so that they could decide for themselves. And um, the application deadline is it was actually on Friday. So we finally closed it and I was sorting through some of them over the weekend. It was very exciting to look at them, but we have not, our, our team is currently in the process of reading through the applications to decide who's gonna get the funding. Uh, but the last slide that I have to show is exciting for me that we got the word out well enough that we got representatives from a lot of the different parts of the state of New York with Rochester, New York winning the award. Somebody did a really good job in Rochester um, letting people know that this award was available and we're excited now we're really digging through the idea of how do we decide who gets the money do we do it about geographic diversity do we want a mix of size of organizations because it ranges from a girl scout troop to a museum trying to get the money um is it for the most innovative is it the best job of integrating if then into what they're doing but one of the questions that i that we actually had to change in our survey um is we told them visit the educator hub on the if then website and look at those ideas there you don't have to follow them but get inspired there and then tell us how you're going to use if then in collaboration with this 500 dollars that we're going to give you and even if people don't get the 500 dollars that alone push them to go look at the website and i'm hoping that even those who aren't funded will keep that idea in their mind of hey this resource is available and i can use it so that's pretty much what I've got. I love that, Sarah. I like how you're still, um, you know, marketing the If Then collection um, for the folks that may not have gotten the grant. And I also really liked your, your point about just creating a survey to understand what your recipients would like and what your state needs. Because a lot of times we, we have great resources like this. And we're like, oh, we want to utilize it this way. But that's not entirely what the organizations that, we're, that it was intended for want it as. And so for you to reach out, figure that out and be able to kind of disseminate that way, that's that's really great. Um, so now we've heard from three different states and on how they're integrating and implementing their mini grants um, across their, their great states. And we wanted to open up for, for some questions or if you have any comments. Um, I definitely recommend if you wanted to reach out to a specific state or a specific speaker that you can um, private message them, ask them for an email. Um, they're, I'm sure they're happy to talk to you about what they went through, what they're going through. Um, and such, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a couple minutes to see if there are any questions from the audience, and feel free to come off of mute and um, ask it that way too. You know, we heard a lot from a lot of folks, so it's a it's quite a big chunk of information. I have a question for Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering about your application process. Um, basically, did you have other sort of agenda items part of your application? What kind of things did you ask folks to do? What requirements did they have to fulfill for $500? Sure. So our thought was 500 is a very small amount for large organizations, but a huge amount if you're like a Girl Scout troop. So we did not want to make it off-putting for anybody that it would seem like too much work so we asked for you know name of organization where they're located contact person and a little bit about them we also asked for a secondary person contact person from the organization and they had to be somebody who was either a leader or in a financial uh, level in the organization um, one because we know there's a ton of turnover in this field <laughs> even from the application to when they got the money, we could lose the person. And two, we wanted to make sure there was a little bit of buy-in higher up. And then we just had two very simple questions. And the very first question was the one that ended up getting reworded after we saw our first five or six respondents weren't quite getting at what we wanted. So I actually followed up with them with a second email saying, hey, we decided to reword it and we wanna give you another chance to update your um, request. But it was just saying, look at the website and the Educator Hub specifically, talk about how you will integrate the if then resources into the work that you're doing just very broadly, one to two paragraphs, 
Second one was one to two paragraphs about why is it important to um, for girls to learn about STEM and STEM careers. So another very broad, but only one to two paragraphs. And then we asked for a very loose budget. I created um, a Google Doc that had a list of different potential um, things like Goldie blocks or other ways that they might spend the money. Because at first I was like, wait a minute, we're going to give them these resources, but all of these are free. So they got to have money to spend on something. But do they even know where to even get started on that? So we would we I put together a list of some of the um, top places that I knew of that sold kits and things like that to get some get brain juices flowing. And then we just said it's very loose. Just tell us kind of the categories and rough amounts. Some went really into depth. They knew exactly how much they were going to spend. Others just said, I want to spend 200 on field trips, 100 on this, 100 on that, and, and that is fine. Um, it'll be interesting as we read those applications to see as the people judging it, um, the ones with a little bit more detail may stand out to us and they may end up getting funding because it shows a little bit more evidence that they really put a little bit more thought process into it. But one that I was excited about said that they wanted to do this with high school girls, that they weren't going to give us specific budget details because they wanted the girls to do the budgeting as part of the process and to think they were going to share the resources and stuff like that. But then the girls were going to have to decide what should we um, allocate our funds to. And I thought that's a really kind of cool thing. I that's a really neat idea is um, using the, the girls themselves, the students themselves to kind of giving them the leadership skills, right, to, to develop a budget themselves and then implement a program. That's really neat. That's cool. You'll have to let me know if that's that they get selected. Um, I look forward to their their final results, too. Sounds good. Thanks for the question, Dale. Um, I have a question for Sierra, um, and it's about you know as as she's a student teacher currently um actually in in the school right now as she presented for us um how this kind of work with the if then collection and working with programs across state is kind of affecting you know are you seeing any changes within your school itself um with the if then collection and kind of the conversations you're having with your peers your teachers yeah absolutely that's a great question um I think this has been a really great project for me to work on because I am active in the schools, um, you know, and I'm working with a diverse population of students. So I was just in a first grade classroom, which elementary school, you know, just looks so differently. Um, but one of the first activities we did in science was what does a scientist look like? Um, and so for them, that was draw a picture of a scientist. And as, you know, as young as six and seven years old, girls are still drawing men in white lab coats. So it's like, that's such an important narrative to change. Um, and it's been pretty, you know, great for me to have this resource for my students to be like, okay, here's what you think a scientist is. Here's what this also is. Like, here's this amazing woman who's doing, you know, we have um, a few from Montana in the Ascent Collection. I'm like, here are Montana women that are, right, that are working in STEM that can kind of change that narrative. Or um, a lot of my first graders are interested in animals. So I'm like, hey, here are some amazing women that are working with animals. So science doesn't have to look like a male in a white lab coat. You know, there's a lot of different perspectives on that. And I'm actually in a middle school um, special education placement, which is a complete 180, you know, flip from that. So their perspective is really different too. Um, so like myself, I've been using the FN collection. We did a quick search, like what um, women with disabilities are in the science collection. And there are women with disabilities in the Ifen collection. So not only to be able to see women, but also people you know, who have dyslexia also, who are now very successful in STEM fields. Um, it's, it's great, it's so diverse and it's so current. It's changed my mindset, um, but also just having resources to back that up has been really powerful, so. That's great, thank you. I like the, yeah, like the so secondhand thanks. effect of the collection. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, if there are any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, for the remainder 10 minutes, what we wanted to do is show you the collection. I think that's an important part of why you all are here today, because um, it's, it's a great resource. And we want to make sure that you all have you know, access to it and you know how to use it. And so in Sarah's survey, when she talked about maybe like a step step by step uh, video on how to utilize it, that's actually we're, we love that feedback because we were receiving that feedback from others as well 
because if you're not on a webinar with us where we actually walk you through it and you go to the website and it's your first time seeing it, it may be a little confusing or a little daunting. And so we have a great video here for you today to, um, um, to go through the, the collection. Welcome. In this tour, we'll highlight some of our favorite resources in the If Then collection and show you how to search for exactly what you need. The collection showcases more than 150 inspiring women STEM professionals with videos, photos, and activities that are free for educational and other non-commercial use. Start by scrolling down on the homepage to hero videos under the featured categories. In these three minute videos, women innovators share their diverse STEM journeys. They have careers that range from shark tagging, fashion design and producing video games to fighting viruses and climate change. Click an image to start the video. Most of the videos have English and Spanish closed captioning. Once the video starts to play, simply toggle the closed captions on and off. Be sure to click the X in the top right corner to close a video and return to the Hero Videos page. Use the search box, just like you would Google, to type in a subject or keyword and hit return. These four women either work for or mention Google in their videos. After you start a video, click the information icon, the eye in a black circle, to see a description, keywords, and more. In the transcript area, you'll see that Terry works as an investor at Google Ventures. At any time, you can click the logo in the top left corner to return to the home page. Another great featured category to explore is Ambassador Profiles. Click the images to meet 125 AAAS If Then Innovators select so sorry. selected from a wide variety of industries. These profile PDFs have the ambassadors' personal statements, biographies, social media and contact links, topics of interest, and so much more. On the home page, click the purple Educator Hub button atop the image to visit this one-stop shop. With ideas for using the collection's authentic and relatable content about women in STEM. No matter where you are on the site, you can click the full collection in the top menu for an advanced search page. Browse, search, and filter nearly 3,000 posters, activity sheets, videos, field shots, and other photos. Use search to comb through the entire collection by subject or keyword. It searches document, text, and video transcripts, not just asset titles. For example, type first generation to see STEM innovators who are the first in their family to go to college. Use the drop-down filters to narrow results by asset type, STEM discipline, geographic location, or ambassador name. Click the X to remove an individual filter or click clear all to start over. These assets are meant to be shared. Click the icon to copy a link or to grab embed code to add the asset to your site. It will ask for your email and that you agree to the terms of use. Questions? On any page, click FAQ in the top menu to get answers to the most common questions. Thanks for taking the tour. We hope you'll use the collection to inspire students and to shift how the world perceives women in STEM. We love it. Yes, we love that the, this video is now available in the If Then collection um, and you can go in and really just, I, I sometimes I spiral. I'm like, oh, let me look at this one video and then I find another video associated with it and I keep going through it and there are so many features that you can utilize um, including the educator hub and all the featured categories. It's a really neat collection. Um, we hope you utilize it in any of your programmings um, because it is a free resource and we, we love that as educators. Free resources are really important. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is some upcoming webinars that we actually have and so well, 
excuse me. There. Welcome. Okay, there we go. So we have two upcoming webinars. Um, we, as an implementation partner of the Million Girls Moonshot Initiative, um, we have also created a MGM, so Million Girls Moonshot Portal, and this is centered around the equity and inclusion framework. And I'll have Jessica uh, drop that in the chat. It's a great uh, portal that really helps um, out of school time educators and after school educators um, uh, kind of focus on specific topics around uh, accessibility, diversity, and inclusion. So that's a great resource for you. Um, and then we're gonna be speaking on a couple more things for Mailing Girls Moonshot. Um, on Tuesday, November 16th, which is next week, we have a lessons learned from an equity and inclusion community of practice. Myself and another coworker um, led a community of practice for about five sessions around equity and inclusion. And so come to hear from participants from that session as well as us on how we, you know, implemented it and the the what the uh, participants are now doing in their, their fields of work. And then another one on Tuesday, December 7th, which is Celebrate Computer Science Education Week with the If Then Collection. And this is where we'll, be, we'll have um, some computer science uh, STEM professionals from the If Then Collection, uh, ambassadors from the collection on the call as well, talking about their work and the importance of computer science education. So we hope you join us for either and both of those. And with that, I think that brings us actually to the end of our call. Five minutes to spare. We love adding more time um, to everyone's calendar. So go ahead and um, Jessica's putting in the, the link to the webinar. So if you want to join us, make sure to um, register. Hey, Larry, right. could, yeah. I just hold, could I just hold this up? Someone was asking about the postcard and I think Jessica's going to send graphics. But yeah, it's a little, can... I just thought I'd show the little postcard, but what was also nice is we could in our case, we were advertising the festival, but then also um, Lipscomb was advertising um, their engineering program. So it's really met everybody's needs. So um, so these are graphics that obviously you guys all sent us, but were manipulated by one of our sites. So I just thought I'd show you how, how simple it was. And I had a quick question for Jessica. Um, when digging through, I've been emailing back and forth with you about finding the people from New York. What are the plans for updating these resources as these women move, change employers, those types of things? How, um, how, how is that planned out? That's a great question. So um, the, the ambassadors can update their profiles um, through AAAS. So that's who manages that piece. And then they, send the updated information to us and we put it in a new profile up for them. So it's just as it happens, they reach out to AAAS and then it gets kind of filtered through and uploaded to the collection. And that's why sometimes when you search, you might see a profile for somebody and then you might search for them again in you know two weeks or something and it might be down, pulled down because it, we're updating that information. But yes, uh, we are regularly updating it. And as Karen said, we're keeping it fresh. Um, yeah, making sure we have all the newest info. And I hope that, you know, uh, inspiration struck for some of you all after hearing from um, our grantees who then had their own mini grantees so that you can talk, think outside of the box with some of these ideas and really, um, you know, really just make sure that STEM is accessible to all and we're making sure that it's representative of our communities around us. So um, with that, I think we're, we're just going to end a couple, a few minutes early. Thank you all for joining. Um, we hope you have a great day. And like I said, this uh, webinar is recorded and I'll be on our website later um, this week. So you can take a look at it again or share with the others. All right, everyone have a great day and enjoy the rest of your week.